Um, what I want to start with today is I want to do. Uh, first of all, I want to do a, a little bit of introduction to the course. Uh, number one, I want to put calculus in its historical context because the development of calculus is one of the most important events in our culture. Right? It's one of the seminal events in the develop, certainly in the development of the sciences, which transformed Western civilization. Uh, so I just want to do a really brief history of how calculus fits in to um, uh, the intellectual history of our culture. Uh, and then I want to introduce a few historical problems and, uh, and I want to do a little bit of review, not a whole lot, but a little bit of review. So let's talk about math and uh, where mathematics came from. Uh, and again, just bare bones sort of introduction. Uh, mathematics started with the Greeks. Um, somewhere, oh, well, starting around 600 B.C. all the way through um, the uh, uh, Roman Empire in its glory days through its decline, the Greeks were developing what we know as mathematics today. They are singularly responsible for what we call mathematics. Um, they were basically uh, geometers. The Greeks completely developed the system of geometry uh, that we call the Euclidean system. Um, in almost its entirety, right? Two-dimensional, three-dimensional geometry, and along with a uh, deductive system for justifying uh, their results, uh, the Greeks were pretty much single-handedly responsible for all of that. And so this is where mathematics starts. But the Greeks had some t really significant shortcomings, and probably most important of all, they didn't have a number system like we do. They really didn't have a system of abstract numerical values to operate with. And that was a real impediment to their progress. So while they were able to completely fill out uh, the, um, the uh, uh, basics and, the, uh, and, and more developed uh, theorems within geometry, they were very limited because uh, they lacked that numeric system uh, that we're so used to today. It's hard for us to imagine what it must have been like to be doing geometry without you know, a number system but that's the way they did it. Uh, so around 300 AD, of course, uh, this was the, the Roman Empire was in its decline, and very quickly, uh, with the rise of uh, you know the uh, Christian civilization, uh, all of Greek learning and uh, their progress in the sciences came to a complete stop, and the West entered into a period uh, known as the Dark Ages. Um, so not only uh, did um, uh, not only did uh, uh, what we normally consider scientific and uh, you know mathematical learning come to a halt, uh, it was looked down upon. Right, it was uh, the product of a pagan society, and so uh, a lot of the old books, uh, you know, what we call what we call books, uh, a lot of that material was destroyed or written over for other purposes, and uh, a lot of that learning completely disappeared from Western culture, and was forgotten almost totally. But uh, there was a second uh, mathematical development going on simultaneously. While the West was in the Dark Ages, uh, we saw a new um, sort of renaissance in Arab culture. The Arabs retained all the Greek knowledge, and not only that, they expanded on it. And what the Arabs did, and this is a, you know, uh, on the one hand, uh, geometry is an essential component to what we're going to call calculus. But geometry alone uh, was insufficient. What we really needed was a system of algebra. And that's what Arab culture contributed. Not only did they construct a, uh, a, a system of algebraic representation, but they also developed the number system. Right? The decimal system that we have today was a direct result of Arab learning. And again, uh, this was uh, during the high point of uh, Arab culture. Right? There was a time when it looked like Arab culture was going to completely dominate the Western civilization, um, but didn't quite work out that way. Uh, but from about 600 AD through, I don't know, maybe about 1000 AD, uh, the Arabs completely developed a system of algebra and a numeric system to go along with it. Finally, uh, around, uh, I don't know, 1200 AD, uh, around there, uh, Western culture started to come out of the Dark Ages, and by uh, the early 17th century, uh, the dominating figure of Isaac Newton came along. Uh, this was in, uh, he was a student, right? He was an, actually a student at the university, 
at uh, Cambridge, I believe. Uh, and there was an um, uh, outbreak of plague, and uh, he had to leave campus and go to his country house where his family lived. And during those few years, he developed single-handedly the calculus. And the calculus was the, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, it was the amalgamation of these two cultural achievements, the geometry of the Greeks with the algebra of the Arabs. And uh, it was a brand, it introduced a whole new period. The reason Newton needed the calculus was because he was developing a scientific system that we all know today. It was the birth of modern science. The calculus for Newton was just uh, a tool, a tool to help him to develop the scientific system that dominated Western culture until Einstein's theory of relativity came in. So, um, so there we go. Uh, and of course, everything changed, right? Newton was an instant celebrity. He was one of the most significant figures in all of Western culture. And uh, other people uh, came behind him to develop these ideas more fully. Um, but that's where our modern culture began. Modern culture began when Newton developed calculus and scientific explosion, uh, you know, the, mod the idea of modern science, which there, was, there really was no true science in the, in the sense that we consider science today until Newton developed the calculus, invented his system, and changed everything. So that's where calculus came from. It was a long, tortured journey uh, to get to where we are today. Um, but there we go. There's a quick history of how calculus fits into our um, modern culture. Um, here's a couple of historical problems that the calculus was needed to solve. Um, here's one of the most famous, uh, you know, the, the uh, Greeks, this again, this is a Greek invention, this, uh, this paradox here. Um, uh, Greeks were terribly imaginative and inventive. Um, this is the, uh, the story of Achilles and the tortoise. So Achilles challenges the tortoise to a race. Um, to be fair, Achilles gives the tortoise a head start. Okay. Can Achilles win this race? Well, the answer is no. He can't possibly win. Why not? Okay, well, here we go. Here's Achilles. He's going to start here. Here's the tortoise. He gets a head start. So, I don't know. Maybe the tortoise is going to start here. Okay. In order for Achilles to catch up with the tortoise, he has to get at least as far as the tortoise had a head start. So, before he can... Whoops. Let me get my pins here. Um, before Achilles can actually catch up with the tortoise, he actually has to get as far as the tortoise started. There's nothing here. So Achilles has to get at least this far. And I don't know how much time that'll take him. Well, let's call that time one. So it takes uh, Achilles T1 seconds or minutes to get to the point where the tortoise started. Well, in the intervening time, the tortoise has moved forward. So, not as far as Achilles, but he certainly has. If he started at here, then he's also moved ahead in that same amount of time that it took Achilles to get where the tortoise started at the beginning of that interval. Okay? Now what? Well, once again, for Achilles to catch up, he has to get at least as far as the tortoise was ahead of him when the second interval started. So here's Achilles on the second interval. He's at least got to get this far. Here's a second time interval, T2. But by the time Achilles gets at this point, once again, the turtle has already moved ahead. If the turtle, if it took Achilles T2 time to get there, well, the turtle has had an opportunity to move forward a little bit further. Achilles can never catch up. No matter how, but just the fact that the tortoise has a head start means that in order for Achilles to catch up, he has to get at least to the point where the tortoise was at the beginning of the interval. The tortoise has always moved ahead. So the answer to the question is no. Is that right? Do you think that Achilles can't beat the tortoise? What's wrong with this? Doesn't matter. Achilles has a this Achilles has some average speed. Achilles can run 100 miles an hour. The tortoise can run one mile an hour. Doesn't matter. 
for Achilles to catch up with the tortoise, he has to get to the previous starting point. The tortoise has already moved. Maybe not very far, but he's always ahead. And of course the answer is, of course, Achilles, you know, we know that's not true. We know that Achilles will eventually catch up as long as he's running faster. The question is, what's wrong with his reasoning? This is a mathematical problem that the Greeks were completely unable to solve. They did not understand, in fact, you know, uh, in fact, without the calculus, it's difficult to see exactly what the problem with this model is. But at least intellectually, right, at least uh, certainly in an intuitive sense, uh, this is absolutely, uh, this is a, exactly as it appears. Right? It's a paradox because we know it's not true, but we can't really see what the uh, problem with the reasoning is because the reasoning is rock solid. But no, it's not right. Turns out that in order to solve this problem, you needed the basic concepts of calculus. Um, now, I'm not sure if we'll be able to solve this problem this semester. I think the, in the long term, it's going to take calculus two before you're able, going to be able to see uh, exactly how we can deal with this problem logically to actually uh, produce a solution. Um, but this is one of the motivating factors. Uh, again, clearly there's a problem here with, with what's going on, but uh, at the geometric level, at basic algebraic level, it, there's no answer to this, this problem. There's, there's no uh, actual counterexample to the reasoning. Um, it wasn't until calculus and its concepts were invented that we were able to respond to this in the appropriate way. Okay, so there's one of the historical problems that motivated the construction of the calculus. Um, here's another one, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this. We're going to do this very early on. In fact, these next two problems we're going to solve very quickly. Um, the second problem that was historically motivated was a pr problem in geometry, the problem of what's called the tangent line. A tangent line is a line that touches a curve at a point but doesn't actually cross it, uh, you know, kind of like this. So here's some curve in space. Um, here's some point on the curve. The tangent line just touches that point but doesn't actually pass through the curve, doesn't intersect the curve in any more than that, <coughs> that one point. <coughs> So that's supposed to be my tangent line. It only touches the curve right here, just one point. <coughs> the Greeks understood this problem because the Greeks worked with curves and uh, basic two-dimensional space and three-dimensional space, right? This is a three-dimensional problem as well. But they couldn't solve this problem. Given an arbitrary curve, how can you construct... Now, for us, we can actually put this in a little bit uh, a more familiar language. Uh, the equation of a line. I hope everybody is aware of how to find equations of lines. If you don't, we're going to be doing that very quickly. <coughs> uh, in general, in order to find the equation of a line, you need two pieces of information. You either need two points or you need one point and slope. The problem here is that I don't have two pieces of information. The only thing I know for sure is the point. I know this line passes through the point, but how do I know what its slope is? In fact, this line doesn't have a second point to pass through, so the only thing, other thing I need to know is what this line's slope was. Well, that information is not at all obvious from the description. Now, one thing I can do, I can try and measure this. I can try and do a measurement here, maybe try and measure rise over run, like so, right? Um, but if I'm, gonna, if I'm going to uh, devolve to measurements, then I've always got a margin of error. No measurement is perfect. All our measurements are inherent, have inherent error. Uh, so if that's the word root I'm going to go, I can't get an exact answer. Now I can approximate it, but I can't find it exactly. How do we solve this problem when we don't have the necessary information? Right? If all I know about this line is one point, then it doesn't look like there's sufficient information to actually construct the tangent line. The Greeks were well aware of this problem. They spent a lot of, they could solve it for some specific examples, but they weren't able to create a general method in which tangent lines could be constructed to curves in an arbitrary sense. And again, the obvious problem is the missing information. It's not sufficient as given to solve the problem. So how do we do it? How do we actually solve this problem? 
turns out that it was the calculus and its concepts that were required to complete uh, this mystery. <clears throat> and a similar problem, uh, as we're going to see, uh, this turns out to be a, a very similar idea. Instantaneous rate of change. Uh, if I, in particular, with respect to motion, right? and of course that was Newton's problem. The Newton, the Newton science started with an analyzing motion in space. Uh, and so uh, what Newton was interested in was this idea of instantaneous change. Um, now we have a way of computing average change. Right? If, I'm, if I'm in my car, say, you know, and I'm going forwards, uh, suppose uh, I'm able to cover 100 miles in, I don't know, uh, say, um, uh, how long will it take to cover 100 miles? I don't know, let's make it simple, uh, in two hours. <coughs> right. What's the average rate of change? How fast am I going on average across that interval? 50 miles an hour. 50 miles an hour right? Uh, the rate of change is equal to distance divided by time. In this case, I'm able to cover 100 miles in two hours. So I'm moving at an average rate of 50 miles per hour. <coughs> so this R here represents the average rate. Well, I don't want to know the average rate. I want to know how fast I was going right here. What was my rate of change at this instant? No time has passed. I want to know at this particular instant, how fast is my car moving? Well, at an instant, time is equal to zero. Well, that's not going to work here. I can't put zero in the denominator of a fraction. That's undefined. So, how do I know how fast I'm moving at an instant? How do I know that? No, I'm asking you. If you're in your car, how do you know how fast you're moving at that particular instant? Because your speedometer, of course. That's what your speedometer is moving, uh, measuring. Your speedometer measures your instantaneous rate of change because it's a measuring device designed to do just that. But how do we solve this problem? Uh, uh, exactly, again, that's a measuring device. Right? It is at best an estimate. No matter how accurate your, the speedometer is, it can never give you the exact speed. But it was designed to do just that. It was designed to answer that question about instantaneous change. But there's a mathematical problem with that. And the way that we normally compute averages doesn't fit this model. Right? If I really need to compute the average, I need some interval of time over which I can measure the change. Without that interval, I have no way to compute this value in any precise fashion, <coughs> or in any fashion at all. Division by zero is undefined in our number system. Uh, so that's another problem. And that was Newton's problem. Newton was really interested in knowing how fast was a particular object moving at an instant, not on average, but instantaneously. And the development of the calculus was his solution to that problem, and it turns out that it solves these other problems too at the same time. So there's a historical context in which the calculus became what it is, and the sorts of problems that it was designed to solve. Um, in each one of these cases, uh, we've got a, a, a totally different context. The paradox of motion in, in Zeno's model. Um, the geometric problem of measuring uh, the tangent line and finally, uh, the physical context in which Newton proposed his model for solving these problems in physics. <coughs> okay. Um, okay, so that's just an introduction and it's kind of a, a motivation for what we're about to see. Uh, we're going to solve these first two problems very quickly. Uh, not this week, but next week, I think, and maybe the week after, uh, we'll solve these two problems. Um, uh, the paradox probably has to, we'll have to wait until you do uh, infinite series, um, but that will come. Okay, what I'm going to do now, uh, let's stop for now. Let's, uh, it's, uh, we're about halfway through. Let's go ahead and take our break. So I'm going to take about 10 minutes, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to do a little bit of review, and then we're going to start doing some real calculus. So uh, give me 10 minutes.